Madam President, before the uh, Democratic whip, the Assistant Majority Leader leaves the floor, I just want to acknowledge uh, the great work he's done in standing up for consumers and protecting their interests. And it fits with the uh, purpose for which I rise today, which is to talk about protecting our public lands and the importance they hold for all of us as Americans. Um, they're really at the heart of the way of life that we hold so dear in Colorado. Uh, in addition, I want to talk about how public lands are important to an issue that all of my colleagues care about, and that's creating jobs. Now, I know many of my colleagues, including the presiding officer, understand the value of public lands, but I want to take uh, a few minutes and list some of the reasons that I think that they're a vital thread in the fabric of our country. First, we are a nation of explorers and risk takers, constantly in search of the next challenge to overcome or the next mountain literally to climb. Public lands, especially in the West, are a reminder of this heritage. And I want to also acknowledge that in the great northeast of our country, where the presiding officer lives, that we, we have mountains and we have extensive public lands as well. And I know that same spirit is infused in the people of New Hampshire. But our public lands also benefit our communities across the country through the clean air and the clean water that they provide. And in urban and rural areas alike, open spaces filter and clean our air and water, improve the environment for surrounding communities while lowering stormwater management and water treatment costs. Access to the public lands and the many opportunities they provide are a key reason why many of us choose to live in the West. And I know this is particularly true in Colorado where public lands and outdoor recreation are truly in our blood. It's also one of the reasons that Colorado is one of the most active and healthiest states in the country and why I've been encouraging children and families across the nation to get outside and stay active, especially in our national parks. But uh, Madam President, the public lands are also, to coin a phrase, in our wallets. When discussing public lands, we can't forget their importance to our economy. Our public lands have long been a source of economic value, and multiple use is a key component of the management of our public lands. An example, extractive industries such as oil and gas development and mining will continue to be an important part of our economy in the West. But these uses are certainly not the only economic uses of our lands. Outdoor recreation, hunting, hiking, biking, the list goes on and on, are a major use of our lands. And our outdoor recreationists not only enjoy our land, they also support a large and growing industry of supply stores, manufacturers, guides, hotels, and other important businesses. And in fact, Madam President, in this time of economic uncertainty, outdoor recreation and tourism are two of the bright spots in our economy. And I want to draw attention to the chart that I brought to the floor to those viewing the floor of the Senate today. Uh, in 2006, the Outdoor Industry Foundation found that biking, hiking, and hunting and all the other outdoor recreation activities add $730 billion to our economy every single year. And perhaps most importantly, this is an area of our economy that continues to grow. It's grown by more than 6% just in 2011 alone and has outpaced U.S. economic growth more generally. These numbers really tell a powerful story of the outdoor recreation industry's contribution to our economy. Now, we hear a lot about the problems that government causes, and there are certainly areas that we can reform. We can streamline government, make it more efficient. We can get government out of the way where appropriate, and we can increase oversight where necessary. But when I was traveling my home state of Colorado over the summer, like the presiding officer travels her state, I heard a lot about how government is working I heard about partnerships between federal, state, and local governments, private businesses, and local stakeholders to preserve and protect our natural resources. And these efforts are improving the lives of Coloradans. They're creating jobs, they're making communities a better place to live, and they're building future economic opportunities. And I want to share a couple of examples in that vein, Madam President. In July, I was in the uh, town of Creed, which is in the historic San Luis Valley of Colorado. And among other stops, I met with the Willow Creek Reclamation Committee. And this is a uh, wonderful example, this committee, of citizens at the local level coming together to 
take on a problem and create solutions. And in this committee, you have retired miners, artists, local business people, ranchers, vacation homesteaders, and federal and state officials who are working together to clean up pollution in their watershed. The narrow valley that's above Crete is lined with abandoned mines. And while the area boasts some of the best examples of mining structures you'll find in the western United States, pollution from these abandoned mines hurts water quality. And the pollution was so bad that residents in the area feared that Creed would be placed on the national priorities list for a Superfund cleanup, a prospect that any community who's faced it understands would hurt their tourism-based economy. So in 1999, the residents formed this committee to do something about it themselves. And they worked with the Environmental Protection Agency, the Forest Service, the Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, state agencies, and many others, and developed a plan to clean up their watershed. And the plan they came up with is truly a comprehensive approach that recognizes the full value of their watershed to their community. And what struck me most, and again, I know the presiding officer has senses and, and experiences the same spirit in her state of New Hampshire, is that nobody was talking about whether they were a Democrat or Republican. They weren't trying to wage political or partisan battles. They saw a problem affecting their livelihoods. They banded together as a community. They partnered with the federal, state, and local government officials, and they did something about it. Now their streams are healthier, their land is healthier, and their economy is healthier. And I'd like to, to bring some of that creed pragmatism here to Washington, D.C. Our public lands are an invaluable natural resource. I hope we can come together in the Congress with policies and solutions to wisely utilize and conserve them. And in that spirit, let me provide some additional examples of what we could do here in the spirit of the people in Creed, Colorado. One incredibly successful government program that's been instrumental to the growth of outdoor recreation across the country is the Land and Water Conservation Fund, or the LWCF is the acronym. And in fact, it's been proven over and over again that every dollar of LWCF funding creates an additional $4 in economic value. And LWCF was developed on the belief that as we develop and exploit our oil and gas resources, we should have set aside also some land for hunting, fishing, and recreation for the enjoyment of future generations. So we as a country set up a mechanism whereby royalties from oil and gas leases were to fully fund LWCF projects. Now I have to tell you that instead of that mission being fully fulfilled, instead every year those dollars are taken out of LWCF for other unrelated government expenditures, leaving in its wake a huge unmet need in each state across the country. While royalties flow into the government coffers, LWCF has continually been raided and it's authorized $900 million of funding every year has been fulfilled only twice since 1964. Only twice since 1964 has that full $900 million been appropriated. Now, not only are we robbing future generations of critical open spaces and outdoor recreation, we are under-investing in our assets, our public lands that would drive job creation. I serve as the chairman of the National Parks Subcommittee, and I've seen how these funds have been particularly useful to our parks. And there's no better example in my state than the creation of the Great Sand Dunes National Park and Preserve. This magnificent park and preserve was made possible by LWCF appropriations that were obtained with very strong local support. Great Sand Dunes protects one of our nation's great landmarks and it's also a source of tourist dollars for the surrounding rural communities. And that's why I've joined several of my colleagues, including Senator Bingaman, Senator Burr, Senator Bacchus, the presiding officer, and others to fight for full funding of LWCF. The point I want to emphasize here on the floor today to my colleagues is that when we talk about natural resources, we aren't just talking about beautiful landscapes and future generations. There are incredibly important economic benefits to preserving and protecting these lands. And in that spirit, I want to briefly discuss another key component of our public lands system, wilderness. 
Lands classified as wilderness with a big W are critical to our multiple use management strategy. Some areas should be preserved as wilderness, just as some areas are better suited to mining, oil and gas development, or off-road vehicle use. Wilderness provides opportunities for backpacking, fishing, hiking, grazing, and hunting, as well as protecting these precious landscapes for future generations. Wilderness, Madam President, also provides opportunities for our veterans to re-enter, reconnect, and heal. And I have a column here from the Denver Post yesterday that speaks to the ways in which veterans can reconnect to their purpose in life and to re-enter society. And I'd ask unanimous consent that it could be included in the record. Without objection. It's an inspiring column, uh, and it speaks to the power of wilderness and wilderness activities in the context of our veterans returning home from standing up for us in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, speaking of wilderness opportunities, uh, just this last week I introduced the San Juan Mountain Wilderness Act along with Senator Bennett. And similar to a bill that I introduced in the last Congress, my bill would designate, and we have a photograph of this wonderful, inspiring area, uh, this bill would designate 33,000 acres in southwestern Colorado as wilderness. It would also designate about 22,000 acres as a special management area and withdraw over 6,000 acres from mineral entry lands within the Natarita Canyon area. Now this bill is the work of extensive input and collaboration uh, among and across every imaginable stakeholder group. And I want to particularly note the efforts of former Congressman John Salazar and his staff who worked with the affected Colorado County Commissioners, interested citizens, and my staff in developing this legislation over the last four years. It's crafted to take into account the various ongoing uses of these lands, such as for water supplies and recreation, while also providing strong managerial protection for these sensitive lands. I don't have to tell you uh, when you see this photograph among many that this region of Colorado is blessed with stunning beauty. Much of the land proposed for wilderness and other protections in our legislation are additions to existing wildernesses such as the Mount Sneffels Wilderness Area and the Lizardhead Wilderness Area. The bill also establishes a new area called McKenna Peak. This peak presides over imposing sandstone cliffs which rise 2,000 feet above the surrounding area. It also provides important winter wildlife habitat for large numbers of deer and elk, which then draws many hunters from all over the country every year. Over 30,000 recreation use days are recorded annually during hunting season in this one game management unit. That is a significant number of recreation user days. The bill would also establish a Sheep Mountain Special Management Area. Since helicopter skiing currently exists in this area, the legislation designates the area in a way that protects its wilderness character but still allows this use to continue. This is, in my opinion, the type of flexibility that's a key for sound wilderness protection proposals and is a shining example of how protection can coexist with responsible use. Madam President, what I'm saying is the bill's been carefully tailored and crafted to apply deserving protections to these lands. This is how wilderness should and can be done. Now, between all of the benefits, clean air and water, recreation and economic growth, one would think that Congress could work together and enact common sense public lands legislation like my San Juan's wilderness bill. But I'm frustrated, I know the presiding officer is frustrated that this Congress hasn't recognized the opportunities that are before us. Instead of what I saw happening on the ground in Creed, Colorado, it seems like our politics here inside the Beltway are getting in the way of moving our country forward. A uh, prime example of politics getting in the way, at least in the Senate, I'll come back to why I say just in the Senate, is a bipartisan bill that I've introduced called the Ski Area Recreation Opportunity Enhancement Act. I've worked closely with Senator Barrasso on it. We have a, an additional 10 co-sponsors across the country. 
in the House, Representative Bishop and Representative DeGette have championed this bill. And our bill would simply clarify that the Forest Service may permit year-round recreational activities where appropriate on ski areas on public lands. It includes no new federal spending, which I think is an attractive element in the legislation. It would actually increase the amount of money coming into the federal treasury because it would likely increase permit fees. And the bill would boost year-round activity in ski resorts on public lands, providing more opportunities for outdoor recreation, creating jobs in the process, and aiding those rural economies that surround ski areas. And in fact, the bill is so bipartisan and strongly supported that it passed the House last night by a vote of 394 to nothing. No House members voted against the bill. And yet, despite bipartisan, bicameral support for the bill and the fact that it would create jobs, I've not been able to get this vote, this bill, I should say, to a vote on the floor of the Senate. I'm tempted to ask for UC unanimous consent that the bill pass, but I will continue to work uh, in the regular order here to move the bill to the floor of the Senate and to passage. Madam President, I had a long career, uh, if you want to call it that, as a high altitude mountain climber before I came to the Congress. Uh, that experience has prepared me to serve in the House and now the Senate in unexpected ways. In 1992, I was on the south face of Mount McKinley, known to the people of Alaska as Denali as well. And we were 10 days into what was supposed to be a seven-day climb. We were out of food. The only way to get down was to literally go up and over the top of Mount McKinley. But the lesson I learned in that successful climb was that when you face 20 below temperatures and high winds, the only way home is over the top of the mountain. You've got to work together to accomplish the impossible. And when you do work together to accomplish the impossible, you find a way to make it happen. In some ways, I feel like that's the choice that Congress has to make as we face these challenging times. We can either work together to find a way up and over the summit, passing legislation that will create jobs, fix our budget problems, and start working on the problems that Americans face every day. Or we can keep fighting with each other and, in effect, starving the country of the leadership that I know Congress can provide and that we must provide in these challenging times. So, Madam President, as I uh, close my remarks today, I ask my colleagues to join me in passing this straightforward, bipartisan and common sense ski areas bill and to support full funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. I also ask my colleagues to work with me to enact locally developed wilderness proposals such as the San Juan Wilderness Act. As we tackle the problems of unemployment and how to grow the economy, let's not forget the important role that our public lands can and will play in the future. Madam President, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I yield the floor and I note the absence of a quorum.